Hello everyone, welcome to Critical Praxis week number six. I don't believe it's been six weeks. This channel is really taking off in some really amazing productive ways. Uh, this week, our topic is set by Heather, uh, and the topic reads, please read Maria P.P. P. Ruth's Bill of Rights for Racially Mixed People. And for the record, it comes from this text here, The Multiracial Experience. Uh, I will have the citation for this text below, uh, as well as a copy-paste version of the Bill of Rights that you can turn to, look to, and investigate. And if this is a topic that interests you personally, academically, what have you, I highly recommend looking into Maria P. P. Root's books. They're certainly dated at this point, but certainly still uh, very useful. I, dig I digress. What are some initial thoughts that come to mind in reading Root's bill? How do you understand critical mis mixed race studies? What would a research project look like that embraces bi Root's Bill of Rights? So I'd like to first turn to the Bill of Rights for Racially Mixed People. And Maria Root, uh, who is a mixed race scholar, situates these kind of three basic categories for her Bill of Rights. The first is resistance, the second is revolution, the third is change. And so in the Bill of Rights, I guess in terms of resistance, this is a a political move, essentially, uh, that tries to disrupt the, the status quo. Uh, it's trying to resist uh, some of the dictates that are thrust onto mixed race bodies. And those read that I have the right not to justify my existence in the world. I have the right not to keep the races separate within me. I have the right not to be responsible for people's discomfort with my physical ambiguity. And I have the right not to justify my ethnic legitimacy. Now, uh, in terms of a, a moment of resistance, and I guess I'm gonna, I, I kind of want to just go through each of these points and position my own mixed race body or multiracial body in kind of uh, embodied dialogue with uh, this Bill of Rights. And so in terms of resistance, uh, the status quo would be, for instance, that I do in fact wield white privilege because of the white skin, the way that I perform and look uh, as being white. Uh, I in fact am mixed race. I am Asian, specifically Taiwanese, and white, specifically English slash Scottish mixed. Uh, and in terms of resistance, it's when the assumption that I am white comes to play or comes to bear that I, I acknowledge, yes, I do have white privilege, but I'm not white in the way at least that maybe someone presumes. In fact, the family that overwhelmingly raised me was my Taiwanese family from my brothers and I. I'm the first one actually born in this country on this side or on that side of the family. So it, there's already this kind of uh, really uh, queer dynamic in terms of how my ethnic racial identities kind of start melding in that I'm a mixed race person. I'm first generation in this country on one side, umpteenth generation on another side. Uh, I grew up in basically a, a household that was not traditionally white, that was uh, uh, um, largely influenced by more traditional Taiwanese modalities. Uh, that really set me apart from a lot of my white friends in very interesting ways that sometimes they didn't mark, but I can certainly mark, and I would I would end up looking at, watching, and and really just finding really amazing in terms of how that difference manifested for me and how I'd have to kind of ease my way into performing in a certain way. And through that process of wielding white uh, privilege and growing up in basically white uh, supremacist culture as, as U.S. America, is that I learned to suppress the Asian-ness and to push it aside because even though that was the side that was raising me, my white privilege allowed me the space and the power to not have to acknowledge it. And so as a result, as I've come to uh, over the years to kind of embrace that side of me, I've had to go through a lot of work of working through and out through my own internalized racism. A lot of the problems that I think still plague a lot of people that I know that struggle uh, with 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 their own racial difference, right? That this notion of internalized racism that I too would engage in talks or jokes that made fun of Asian people and other non-white bodies, and realizing that I myself am positioned in those places, but at the same time can never really claim uh, an of color uh, status because of my my white privilege. Uh, in fact, I do recall being at this, um, uh, it was a queer college conference, and they had these breakout sessions for uh, black queer students, for uh, Latin queer students, for Asian uh, queer students, and then they had a mixed race uh, caucus as well, this breakout session for mixed race people, which I thought was great, and had some really productive dialogues with some people about what it meant to be queer and mixed race, uh, and specifically how that linked to political organizing and the difficulties around that, particularly around the tag of, of color when those of us who are mixed race may or may not look of color enough right, that we don't pass enough and that it ends up feeling uncomfortable because it's not really a space for me, and it's not. And it's not a critique of those spaces, it's that that space is not set up in a way that it would necessarily privilege me, but that my white privilege maybe doesn't need that type of uh, collective safe space in the same way, right? And so that was that was certainly a difficulty, and if anything, I suppose I have in some venues identified as a person of mixed race color or a person of multiracial color, 
uh, who wields white privilege. And so I never want to kind of let go of that, uh, that, that weird tension of being mixed race, but certainly performing and looking as white as I do. Um, so the first point is, is resistance, right? The second section is revolution. That is to say that this little set here is seeking to revolutionize the ways in which we see race as these, uh, these set standards, right? These essential categories that really link us and lock us to the ways that, that, that we are racialized. Race, of course, having no actual, uh, I, I guess, bearing, in fact, being uh, this arbitrary uh, categorization system that we put one another into. That's not to say that race doesn't have real world uh, ramifications, right? That it in fact is very real, it's very material, the effects and impact of race itself, uh, as we saw last week with systemic racism. The point is, is that the actual systems or the, the categories that we're placed into are arbitrary to the degree that we just continue to perpetuate them as categories that we're inside of. The mixed race person as revolutionary in this second set is working to kind of get at the root of that problem by, by really embracing the ambiguous body saying, I don't actually belong in either of these categories at all, actually. Uh, and so this set says, I have the right to identify myself differently than strangers expect me to identify. Uh, to identify myself differently than how my parents identify me. To identify myself differently than my brothers and sisters. To identify myself differently in different situations. Um, this is very interesting because when I'm approached uh, with the assumption that I'm a white person, I always have the space to allow and encourage critical dialogue about what that means. Um, I share this with my students often, and it tends to be, has been generally the case throughout my life, that because of my white skin, I have had an, uh, access to and privilege to white spaces. And this means spaces that are dominated by white people and white talk. And what might be my white talk is generally racist dialogue, right? Racist jokes, these jokes that would not be told elsewhere in the presence of a person of color. But the assumption is that because I am white, that I'm supposed to laugh with them, right? That that's the performative expectation that you say this racist joke, I laugh. My response has always been, that's not funny, that's racist. And the resistance I get is always very icky. It's, it's, it's just disgusting. It's this, this idea that I am a mole who was spying on them and I'm now telling them what to do, right? And for me, at least in terms of politics, this is the expectation or my responsibility as a mixed race person who wields white privilege, that it is in fact my responsibility because I have access to these spaces to stop that racist uh, chatter. Uh, the same way that my male privilege allows me access to male spaces where sexist jokes are perpetuated. And that means that it is also my responsibility as someone who believes in the end of sexism or moving towards that, that it is my job, my obligation to stop it. Right? The same way that if I hear homophobic jokes because maybe someone assumes for whatever reason that I'm heterosexual, uh, that I would also stop those, right? So this is part of that revolutionary act. So um, when it comes, th these other, these two in terms of family are very interesting to me. What is common among a lot of mixed race people, at least the research that I've come across over the years here, including myself, is that parents tend to identify themselves one way, the kids one way, they see the kids one way, siblings identify differently. And this is certainly the case, I think, in my family. And not to put anyone necessarily uh, fully, I guess, uh, on the burner, uh, I, I, I would say that I am the only one that I 100% fully embraces being mixed race that uh, is completely okay with the instability, right, of being both and at the same time. And that is certainly difficult, particularly when, I, when it rails up against uh, my siblings who maybe were having a harder time and continue to have a harder time to openly admitting the Asian component maybe of oneself. And it's not to say that, that it's a struggle that, that's, that's dislocated. I think that that's a struggle that mixed race people deal with all the time, negotiating what they are or what we are. Because the way race itself kind of gets perpetuated in the system is that you're expected to identify one way, one way only. And that's the conundrum of the mixed race person, which leads us to this, this last point here that uh, you have the, or I have the right to identify myself differently in different situations. If I am in a, an unsafe space, uh, a, a particularly an unsafe racist space, I do have the privilege to deny and to denounce that mixed race component, that the, the Asian roots that have really influenced me and that are uh, inherently a part of my body. Um, and that's certainly a privilege, and, and a privilege that I do not want to think lightly of, but it's a privilege that allows me to survive, that the mixed race person has these strategic moments where we're able to enact the, the components of our racialized bodies in ways that work to our benefit so that we can continine to thrive. I, I, I almost want to get into a discussion about 
kind of media representations of the mixed race body in this way and that the mixed race body is never seen as a body so much as a catalyst for world peace and domination because we can move back and forth and we're always a part of everyone. And while we are, the point of the Bill of Rights is to say that I'm allowed to establish that and that also means I'm allowed to say no, I'm not going to be part of changing the world in your 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 view, but rather in my view as a mixed race person and what it means to not just be colorblind, but to critically engage in both sides at the same time of my body, being influenced by multiple ethnicities and races at the same time. The final point is change. This That is to say that the final section here is seeking to change the system in total, right? That uh, uh, it frees us from or it's a way to imagine ourselves free from the older dictates of what race used to be or, or was demanding of our bodies. And those uh, set of rights include, I have the right to create a vocabulary to communicate about being multiracial. I identify as multiracial. Sometimes I try on the hat of Hapa, uh, which I believe is a little too uh, Hawaiian for me in terms of not my language whatsoever, but some have also identified me as Hapa as well. Uh, I refuse to ever engage in the discussion of what percent are you, no matter who the person is or who it is I'm talking to. That is a question that is A, intrusive, and B, seeks to ultimately legitimize certain parts of a mixed race person's heritage and body. So take for instance me, I was raised primarily by an Asian side of the family. I'm mixed race Asian white. Does that make me more or less Asian than the white side? No, it just means that I was influenced for with particular cultural backgrounds and histories and legacies in one way, while embedded in a larger white supremacist culture that actually delegitimizes a lot of that in inner in house kind of uh, socialization. So this is kind of getting at some of the, the, the tricky spaces of what it means to be multiracial and why it is that when we look at statistics, when we look at these, these one drop rules, right? The one drop rule for those who don't know in American legacy is that if you had one drop of black blood specifically, that you were slave, period, right? This is the legacy of actually asking for some of these statistical uh, justifications or legitimacies in terms of what your racial uh, background is. That's not to say that Asians, uh, particularly Chinese and Taiwanese people in America were not enslaved in the same way or differently or whatnot. It is to say that there is historical connections to why we ask these questions about race and why it is that we demand that people that are ambiguous uh, put up, put out there what their allegiance is, right? And so the multiracial people, at least when I identify as mixed race, I refuse that allegiance to one side or the other, but rather embrace allegiance to both sides at the same time. The second one is I have the right to change my identity over my lifetime and more than once, and I've certainly done so. Particularly when I was younger, really struggling through internalized racism, I would not even acknowledge the Asian side of me at all. And as I've come to really embrace that, it has been a, 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 a back and forth, a pendulum, and a pendulum doesn't just go back and forth, but rather all sorts of different directions. It allows me to explore different ways of being, different mixed race ways of being, uh, and not afraid to enter those spaces when I'm unclear as to what that space might bring for me. Uh, I have the right to have loyalties and identify with more than one group of people. Uh, this, I think, has been spoken throughout here, that I have access to many spaces. Uh, and without question, uh, I have the right to freely choose whom I befriend and love. And this is a, a huge final point, I suppose, um, that I don't... I, I don't see, and, and I feel like this can be a little utopian, and I want to be careful that it's not just this idea that only mixed race people are allowed to marry outside of one's race, because for the mixed race person, we don't have a race, right? Unless I'm only, I guess, looking for other mixed race people. But it really kind of troubles the logic of what it means to date within a race or what it is to be attracted to a particular body over other types of bodies. In terms of, of I guess, uh, how this Bill of Rights influences research, I think it's very radical. And in fact, recently, uh, Mark Corby wrote in uh, a reader, uh, a recent reader called Identity Research and Communication, uh, he turns to Maria P.P. P. Root's Bill of Rights. I think he does a really good job at opening dialogue about what this could mean for the future of communication and identity research or identity research and communication studies. And so for our discipline, I would say, uh, and, and for me as an academic, as a scholar, that, that, that the Bill of Rights not only empowers me as a researcher, but empowers me to rethink the tools and the methods by which I look at race, racism, racialized discourse. Um, I read a recent article uh, by uh, a, a Nishimi, I believe is the last name of, uh, yes, Nishimi, uh, Leilani Nishimi, in Critical Studies in Media Communication. The article is called Aliens. Narrating U.S. Global Identity Through Transnational Adoption and Interracial Marriage in Battlestar Galactica, 
Yes, Battlestar Galactica. Uh, in this piece, I think that uh, uh, Nishimi does a really good job at articulating some of the difficulties in filming the Asian female body as well as the mixed race body and transnational adoption, a lot of these politics. And I think that in looking to this piece, it really kind of offers a framework, a critical framework by which to um, engage in these contextual dialogues, these critical contextual dialogues. Then we talk about the mixed race body, we can never just know it in the present. We have to situate it within these contextual histories, right? That the Asian white body has to be, particularly for me, right, the Asian white mixed queer body has to be informed by the notions of the inherent femme Asian expectations or the bottom boy expectations, the sexualized overtones, the white supremacist over tones of actually um, the masculine white male taking in the Asian female and marrying and what all of this stuff means at the same time. And I think that all of these dialogues coming together allows for more fruitful discussion about racialized discourse is always inherently tied to one another and never distinct, right? That we can't just talk about this thing and then this thing, but we need to learn how to talk about them multiply at the same time without privileging one over the other. Well, this has been a rather uh, large response, a long response, and I do apologize for the time. If you're still here at this point, uh, whatever minutes into this video, I thank you for watching. I look forward to the other respondents this week. Peace to you all, and see you later.